So with that, let's get started with bioclimactic design um, and our session today. We are going to um, focus on climate metrics that can influence design decisions and define bioclimactic design and explain how it can be a driver for energy efficiency. Uh, compare and contrast effective passive strategies, as well as identify tools for studying climate conditions. Uh, we're going to have two projects that are featured here um, tonight. The first project is going to be the Pikes Peak uh, Summit. Sorry, actually, we're going to start off with a description of what is bioclimactic design. And then we're going to have a project presentation. And then there's a little bit more content. And then we'll shift to another project uh, that before moving to the Q&A. Okay. So the first project is going to be presented. Um, it's the Pikes Peaks Visitor Center. We have Pete Jefferson joining us from Branch Pattern, where he's a principal. He is a mechanical engineer, and Branch Pattern did all of the engineering and um, energy and uh, performance modeling for the Pikes Peaks Visitor Center. And then we also have the Riley Center for STEM Education at Notre Dame Academy. Uh, Brad Randall from Brucey e. Brooks and Associates uh, is going to join David Addy from SMP Architects to present this project. Um, and both are local to our Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia area. Pete is joining us from Pittsburgh. Hey, thanks. Okay, so let's get started. Um, what is bioclimactic design? Um, we know this, you know, we've all probably studied this, uh, the architects in the room in uh, school, where it's the design of buildings and spaces, right? Interior, exterior, and outdoors that make use of solar energy and other environmental sources based on local climate to provide thermal and visual comfort. Um, this before fossil fuels, materials and labor were scarce, slow and expensive. So everything was man-made and we relied on our envelope to mitigate thermal comfort and visual comfort and everything else. And passive strategies were a necessity. We had to build passively and we had to build bioclimactic for these reasons. But with the post-industrial revolution, the machine and technology age make it possible to mass produce materials and make them available anywhere in the world. So our passive strategies are no longer a necessity. So while we understand these concepts um, of bioclimactic design and this definition, uh, we've been freed, right? Uh, air conditioning uh, was a huge game changer. We no longer need to design passive buildings because we can put in an air conditioner or put it in a heating system and allow energy use to dictate what our thermal comfort is. And, um, you know, if you think about it, actually the internet is not possible without the use of cooling. There would be no server farms and, uh, and that's really important, right, for the way that we work today. But I think it's time we need to start rethinking the way that we approach design and returning a bit for returning or rethinking the way that we approach systems. And so that's what we're going to try to do in this session, right? What does bioclimactic design mean for a modern environment? Uh, we're, we're obviously not going to go back to living in clay caves or underground um, as we as it was done once. Uh, we, we live in cities, we have internet needs and things like that. So what does um, bioclimactic design mean for modern environments? And we're going to try to, in this session, we're going to talk about it from two perspectives that um, can drive energy efficiency. The first perspective would be understanding your climate and how your climate is shifting. So how can we design for rising temperatures and extreme weather events? And then we're going to look at also comfort. How can outdoor comfort metrics inform strategies for indoor comfort? Kind of going back to the time where it was a necessity to understand outdoor conditions in your climate or microclimate to inform your design strategies. But how can we do this using all of the technology that is available today? Um, so with that, we're actually gonna start with the first project. Um, Pikes Peak Summit Complex is going to try to answer those questions for us. Uh, it is a once in a lifetime project. So um, uh, 
Ricky, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I think you'll have to let me share here. Bunny, I think you might have to change the permissions on that. Just a second. Or I think you have to stop sharing, it looks like. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There you go. Right. Bear with me a moment. Okay. Are you able to see that? Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. So yeah, I'm happy to join everybody. Talk about, uh, as Jonky said, this once in a lifetime project. It's it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, you know, I'll get into how much of my life this is consumed. Uh, <laughs> probably the the longest project I've been working on, and we are right at. Uh, maybe the first finish line here, because uh, some of the, the the goals of the project, you'll see that when we actually open, we're just sort of beginning the next race towards actual performance here. So um, completing constructions, the, the 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 big one to begin with here. But um, I know every project always loves to say they're the they're they're the first to do something. Um, in this particular case, there's a superlative uh, that. I think has gone unchallenged so far that this is the highest construction project in North America. If anybody knows of one uh, higher up on a summit someplace, let us know, but uh, unless there's an objection to that, I think this one stands for now. So um, this is on top of Pikes Peak, obviously. It's what we call a 14er um, for, for those that have uh, spent some time hiking out west. So uh, essentially a mountain that's above 14,000 feet above sea level. Super challenging climate, uh, which I'll get into, but super challenging place to even construct a building. Um, you've got about 38% less oxygen at the summit. Uh, lightning storms come in without much warning, which is extremely dangerous. I think it was just two summers ago that 13 people were struck by lightning um, while attending the, uh, the Pikes Peak Hill climb race there. So uh, very dangerous environment if you're not careful. Scheduled to open sometime in the summer. Uh, again, that challenging construction environment means that snowstorms come in at any time and they only get to build about half a day up there by the time they get to the summit and then get off the summit. It's um, uh, about, a, about a half day um, and that's not factoring even for weather. So we're looking at a grand opening potentially in late May, but I'd not be surprised if that slips into June. So if you go to the summit once this opens, um, you're kind of seeing a couple couple sneak peeks of, of where it's at. Um, this is another one. This is the, the, the boardwalk to what they're calling the Titanic moment there on the summit. So uh, these overlooks are a big part of the project too. So before getting into kind of the bioclimatic uh, design responses, though, I have to give a little bit of a history um, of the summit and the project in general, because it feeds right into why we made some of the design decisions we, we did. But essentially, there's uh, been about 200 years of history of man conquering the mountain. And I use that term pretty uh, intentionally when I say conquering. What, what I'm essentially talking about are Europeans and Americans, um, settlers climbing to the top of the mountain and essentially planting a flag in it. So um, the, the written record says that it was about 200 years ago today that somebody first summited Pikes Peak. That's what we know about. And essentially when a white guy first summited Pikes Peak, there's actually archeological evidence that um, natives to the area spent time on the summit, um, even finding eagle traps up there. So it's, it's very likely that people visited the summit much earlier than 200 years ago. But 200 years ago is when people started planting flags and um, giving it new names, essentially. It also brought forth transportation to the summit. So it's, it's called America's Mountain um, for several reasons. One, because of uh, Catherine Lee Bates writing America the Beautiful from the summit, but also because it's unique in how people actually get there. You can hike to the top, you can take a cog railway that's um, been there for uh, a really long time since the late 1800s and has just been refurbished and opened back up this year. Uh, and you can also drive to the summit too. And so people have been doing that for a really long time. You're seeing these like iterations of the summit house. I believe this one burned down. Um, and so there have been previous iterations of, of the summit house before we even got involved in the project. 
So suppose you go out to Colorado Springs and you want to take a visit up there today. This is what you're greeted with. Um, not so majestic, uh, you know, with the, the porta johns and the free for all parking experience. And um, if you actually get to the summit house as it stands now, this is what you see that's kind of like low slung bunker. It's a free for all. Um, people just kind of trample all over the, the current summit area. And let's suppose some weather rolls in and you want to take some, some refuge and shelter inside the building. Um, I've heard this lovingly called the highest uh, trinket shop in the US. So a lot of not, um, I mean, people, people enjoy going to the mountain, but not necessarily the experience with the summit house itself. Yet tons of people do it. Uh, again, the last time I talked about this um, was here in Pittsburgh. So apologies for the use of Heinz Field and the imagery here, but 700,000 visitors per year is what we're expecting when the new summit house opens. Um, that is essentially a full NFL season or, or actually even more than a couple games extra on it too. So this is a building that is unique in its environment, unique in its use. And because of the, the number of people that visit it, um, it needs to be resilient. It really needs to hold up. Um, 700,000 people going in and out of the building too means that it's gonna take big gulps of air. So that's something that we're thinking about in, in the response. So that's kind of the past of the Summit House. 2015 uh, is when the, uh, the groups that are involved with uh, managing the Summit House and the, the overall Summit Complex itself got together and decided that they were going to hire a design team to create a new Summit experience there. And so it's unique in my career because we've got five owners on the project. Um, which sounds like a bureaucratic nightmare, but what I would say is this group has been phenomenal to work with. I mean, there's so much potential to just get bogged down, and I was really surprised at how well aligned they were, especially when it came to things like environmental sustainability goals. So there's a group that manages the highway that goes up to the top, the U.S. Forest Service is involved, and because of that, we also have some National Park Service um, that's not part of the Big Five here, but still has has some say on the project. The COG Railway that I mentioned, they're one of the big user groups. The Army has a facility on the top that uh, does high altitude research. And lastly, Colorado Springs Utilities um, is also there. So all of them have a say in this. So responding to the RFP, we got, uh, got the band together. Uh, this is actually a project that we had been thinking about a long time in advance of even the RFP. So um, it, this really great mix of local and, and national expertise, um, even the you know, getting down to interviewing a national architect to come be a part of the team and asking some questions to see how well they would integrate. And uh, I would say that six years of working together, it's proven to be a really cohesive team that had a shared vision. But it didn't happen without taking some risks. And those risks are actually very much related to the, the design response here. So 200 years essentially of, of uh, humans climbing up to the summit, planting a flag on it. Um, I think the, the local aspect of our team really began to, to question that and whether or not that was the right uh, use to plan for um, in, in the, the next 200 years or so. And we didn't want to just replicate um, an existing building that was or, you know, the existing building, but do it in a, a newer fashion and take what was there with a lot of um, kind of tchotchkes for sale and, and not necessarily healthy food and then just roll that into a new building. So it was a bit of a risk to sort of challenge the, the current use of the summit and to say, uh, hey, we think there's a better way to do it. One that causes people to appreciate uh, that unique environment that this may be the only way they're able to get to it because of the roadway, because of the cog railway. Um, for some people, that's the only opportunity they have to experience a high alpine environment there. And we also had in the back of our mind, there are a lot of people that challenge the notion that there should even be a building there to begin with. Um, and from an environmental standpoint, if you're going to construct something in this fragile ecosystem, why do it? It, it doesn't feel good if, it, to me personally, if we were just kind of replicating that, that compromised experience that's there now. Um, so this is a 
relatively famous quote, but I was first exposed to it at a Living Future conference, I don't know how many years ago, and it always kind of stuck with me. And it, it really resonated with me rolling into this project here, that if we could really transform the experience on the summit um, and allow people to appreciate that fragile environment more so than little souvenirs that they, they were buying there, that that would be um, their help contribute to a successful project. So one of the things that we did, again, right off the bat, this was going into the interview, we actually looked at the biomimicry resources handbook, started to think about things uh, in that context of trying to understand what thrives at 14,000 feet above sea level. And I, I mentioned living future. I love kind of everything that ILFI does. Uh, and they have this famous use of um, the sunflower in, in a lot of their, their imagery. But we had to ask ourselves, what's the, the, the thing that thrives in that environment? Is it a sunflower uh, or is it a different type of organism? And I guess it, it sort of made it easier. There aren't that many things that, that do well in that environment. It's essentially lichen and marmots and maybe a few other things in there. So there was a lot that we actually spent uh, trying to learn from those, those different um, uh, organisms that live at that environment. And so being awarded the project, it was a successful approach. Uh, turned out the big five user group had the same thoughts in their mind. They wanted to rethink the experience up there too. They didn't want to just do the same thing they were always doing in a, in a new building. And so we did a bunch of sustainability workshops. We actually found out um, that they were very much supportive of this idea of moving from less bad to good, which I think the Living Building Challenge has made really well known. Um, we even took a look at where their design goals mapped out in relationship to the Living Building Challenge. And what we found was, for the most part, they were really well aligned about the only thing they hadn't talked about explicitly was material use and, and definitely not the red list. And that's not insignificant, of course, um, for anybody that's dealt with the red list, but it made closing that gap a lot easier. So to, to roll into the, the project early in design and have living building challenge certification on the table when it's initially the RFP was only for lead silver was a, a pretty big right. event. Is that a pretty big event. Hey Ruth, I got a little Ruth feedback there. If you could mute. All right. So if we wanna do that, we have to understand climate. Um, and that is no small task here and this little speck on, on top of the mountain there. Um, that's, that's the highway that takes you to the top. The cog comes in from the other side if you're looking at it. So first things first, we have to pick a weather file. Um, that right there as the, the start of the project was, was an interesting dilemma. Um, I actually plotted out just today to give it some context where there are EPW weather files available um, that we could grab. Definitely not one available on Pikes Peak. There's one in Colorado Springs about 10 miles away horizontally. And then there's some others sprinkled throughout Colorado. But if we were to just go off a map, we'd make some really ill-informed uh, choices there because we really have to think three-dimensionally there. So Colorado Springs is at roughly 6,000 feet above sea level. Um, Aspen's at 7,900 feet. And then Pikes Peak, of course, at over 14,000 feet. We got really lucky though. Um, first time in my career I've been able to do this. We actually had a weather station at the, at the project site. So uh, some of that junk there on the roof that's not very attractive is actually very helpful because um, it's, it, it's collecting weather data. So we were given a weather file essentially for about 10 years worth of recordings there. And it sounds like, okay, you just take that and turn it into an EPW file. It was a lot more complex than that. It took us about two months to clean up the data that went into that. As an example, we would find wind speeds in there that were at 100, 110, 125 miles an hour, and then went to zero for two weeks. So if we just took that data as it stood and used it, we'd end up with an artificially low number because what actually happened is at 125 miles an hour, the anemometer blew off the roof there. Um, so we had to do a whole bunch of quality control on that data. Again, it took about two months. Uh, it yielded some really amazing insights though. Um, it told us uh, the sustained wind speeds, for example, 
And a sustained wind speed is measured, I think it's over about 60 seconds. So um, an average over that period of time of almost 70 miles an hour. Um, the gusts and the structural engineers were very interested in this. Um, we were able to find gusts of 148 miles an hour, which then they used for their structural calculations, I think of 195 mile an hour wind loads. Um, and then the design temperatures that we have to design for, we have to uh, go for about minus 50 in the winter and uh, low 70s in the summer. So huge delta T um, from design winter conditions to uh, cooling conditions overall. And kind of the interesting thing for us too is that when we looked at the, the, the climate and overlaid it on ASHRAE climate zone, it's a new climate zone that's not at least on the map here in the lower 48, it's climate zone eight. Um, so in the lower 48, all that shows up in the ASHRAE map till now is climate zone seven. It was also kind of interesting to us too, because uh, while we were going through this, I think Rocky Mountain Institute had just opened up their facility, which by all accounts has done some really amazing things. But we found it really interesting that they were referring to it as uh, not that it was the most efficient building, but that it was located in North America's coldest climate zone. Because when we mapped it out and the scale is kind of wonky on this, apologies for that. But uh, yeah, Aspen's climate zone seven, Pikes Peak is climate zone eight and it's about 65% of the hours per year below freezing on the summit there. So this brutally cold environment that makes designing there a real, real challenge. But we had to. So we were going for living building challenge. Bioclimatic design needed to be an important piece of that. So again, looking to what thrives at 14,000 feet. Um, why does lichen thrive at 14,000 feet? And this type of lichen, not the type of lichen that we find in a Pennsylvania forest, for example, Wind is a huge part of the story there. So we get some snow, yes, but really anything vertical uh, in that environment gets just blasted with the wind. And you throw some snow into the mix, it starts to pile up and it can really pile up. This is in May, just to point out. Um, so we're not even to this point. And that's why I'm a little iffy on whether or not uh, it'll open at end of May because this can always be thrown into the mix. And you have to think about materials. So the architects on the project actually took some different samples of uh, materials that they were considering, took it up to the existing summit uh, complex, put it here, went back a couple months later, and this is how the glass looks. It's essentially sand blasted to a frosted glass. Now they found out that the sample doesn't actually have the same sort of uh, tempering to it that the real glass does, which was good to find out. but these sorts of things had to be put into effect to, to actually come up with a design that responds well. So big question, yeah, how do we work with these forces here and actually have the building um, respond to them instead of fighting it like the existing building did? Lots of wind studies done. One of the big concepts was to hunker the building down. So you'll see some images in a little bit that makes it look like the building actually sticks up. That's really only the entry from the top. Uh, I think it's about 75% of the building overall is at the existing grade and kind of bench cut into the mountains so that the prevailing winds just sweep right over it. So ideally, the, the rocks and pebbles that get picked up by the wind, the snow that gets picked up by the wind blows right over the, the top of it and off the edge of the mountain. And so this maybe gives a little bit of a better example. So the predominant winds would be from the back there of the site and then swoop over the, the, the roof and off the mountain. We also thought about uh, how warm-blooded organisms work and that marmot and, and, and humans in general, and we incorporated that into our thermal comfort strategies. So rather than just treat the whole building as uh, a 70 degree environment, we thought about how people enter in and they're typically wearing coats because it's cold outside. If you go into that environment at 70 degrees immediately, you'll probably start to sweat, you'll be uncomfortable. So the programming even started to respond to areas where we could have large temperature swings as 300 people arrive from the Cog Railway and doors are open for minutes at a time, they're coming in and out. We didn't want that to be 70 degrees and have that huge delta T between indoors and outdoors. So the program responded to that by um, looking at where we can have large temperature swings and where we need low temperature swings because we've got people working there all day. So that was a big part of the strategy. Um, kind of some of the greatest hits, I guess, of bioclimatic design, it's, it's radiant heated everywhere. 
the, the building envelope is like an R90 roof and an R50 wall assembly for the most part. Um, but again, just not even exposing walls. So three out of the four main walls are essentially buried in the earth. So we really only have that exposure to the east and then the roof exposure there. Not an insignificant challenge as well was dealing with Colorado water rights. Um, Colorado has the most restrictive water laws in the country. Um, this project is especially uh, interesting because a drop of water that falls on the summit, depending where it drops uh, there, goes into one of four different watersheds. Um, so that's a really challenging environment where we spent the last six years really um, advocating for changes to laws, advocating for changes to plumbing code. And just this year, I believe, um, or within the last year, I should say, we were successful in getting the Colorado State Plumbing Board to allow for the use of a gray water recycling system, um, which is integral to the vacuum toilet system, kind of like what you would experience on a, uh, on a flight there. So that was a huge accomplishment that we think opens up the doors for a lot of other projects to do that. Um, the savings are really significant when, when if we can do that on more projects in Colorado. So that's really exciting overall. And uh, yeah, Junkie, you'll recognize this next, next one here. And we've talked about this in the past, but kind of putting it all together. Um, like I said, it's sort of the greatest hits of bioclimatic strategies, lots of use of um, passive house principles. We're not necessarily uh, going for passive house certification. We are doing building enclosure testing though on it. We were just doing spray testing up there last month. Um, we're going to do a pressure test on the building here soon, which that's another one. That's the first. I don't know that anybody's ever tried to do a blower door test with 40% less air density or in this environment and with the winds. We're going to give it a go and see how we do and if we can chase out the, the leaks on it. So that's kind of it for the strategies. I'll just kind of quickly, because I know I'm at time here, show some of the, the eye candy imagery. This is what you would experience when you arrive now instead of um, the, the bunker in the past. This is the, the little piece that pops up uh, to represent the visitor entry from above. If you're arriving on the Cog Railway from below, this would be the experience little section, again, it makes it seem in this case, like more of the building sticks up above grade than what actually does. Um, this is a little better representation of that. There's a ton of work being done to restore uh, some of the vegetation and tundra that exists on the surface. It has, actually has to be planted down lower in elevation and then transported up to the summit to, to restore that. And it's super fragile. So if people walk on it, it gets destroyed. And there's a lot of work being done to protect that. Um, got some overlooks and some prominence. Again, another entryway. And then this is kind of the, the big moment that, that frames the view here for everybody that we hope 700,000 people will be experiencing soon. And uh, hopefully in a certified living building here within the next couple of years. So. That's bioclimatic design at Pikes Peak. And I think there's some questions maybe coming in in the chat, at least it's scrolling. Yeah, um, if you guys do have any questions, um, thank you, Pete, for presenting that. This I'm familiar with the project, but it's always amazing to see and learn about it again. It's such a great project. Um, uh, we are going to save the Q&A for the end. Um, so if anyone does want to add any questions in, or if, if there's a quick question, I'm sure Pete would be glad to answer it um, specific to anything in that presentation. Um, I don't see any added here yet. Okay. So we are gonna try to unpack some of the terminology and information that Pete presented, um, kind of tying it back to um, our um, to the theme of our session today. As soon as I find how to share my screen again, because it disappeared. There you go. All right. Okay, can you guys see my screen? No. Okay. So we're gonna talk about climate shifting and uh, the weather files and how that all relates to the energy model. 
Um, and Josh is going to take that. Josh, I can drive for you. Oh, sure. That'd be great. Thanks, Josh. And, and thanks, Pete. That was a, actually a really good project to uh, lead into uh, extreme climates. And um, I think you know, clearly that, that project was uh, very much needing to address all of those things. Um, and I think that's part of the reason the, the previous uh, facility needed to be replaced from, from what I understand. But you can go to the next slide. So, okay. Okay. so as Donkey said, we're gonna, we're gonna work on uh, unpacking a little bit of this and how, to, how do you apply it to, you know, to a, a process that implements uh, bioclimatic design. And you know, to, to kind of identify some terms, define some terms right off the bat. So weather, weather is the state of the atmosphere at a place at a, at a time. Um, heat, dryness, sunshine, wind, rain. Climate, though, is is kind of the prevailing uh, the prevailing conditions over the, over a longer period of time. And as we'll get to, it's it's going to be uh, we're going to be talking about longer periods of time. Um, you go ahead. So. You know, one of the things we're here for as part of the, uh, the AIA uh, 2030 uh, uh, commitment uh, working group is to talk about the problem of, of climate change. And you know, one, one of the key things we have to keep in mind is the climate is changing and, and we've, we've seen signs of it. Um, yet our process, the standard process right now is to take a historical we uh, weather data file and implement that into an energy model. Um, as, as Pete was talking about, they, they were able to actually even set up a very specific uh, site on the top of their, uh, on the top of, or there already was one, I should say, on Pikes Peak, and, and kind of study and, and analyze that data. Um, but, you know, conventionally in practice, um, we're using, you know, packaged data sets that, you know, may, that, um, you know, come come through uh, ASHRAE through EPW the format for NV plus. Um, they they come in, and we'll we'll get into those a little bit. They um you know they, they they sample years, and but it's historical information, and that information though is changing. So climate shifting is you know is the topic we're we're going to be addressing here, and and in the context of extreme weather, I think that was a great lead in. So. This is a this is a map. Uh, you're looking at the United States in 2050, Pennsylvania um, through 2099, 90 degree days uh, uh, on the right in Pennsylvania. But but think about this as as we're designing projects uh, and, and going forward uh, for Philadelphia. The um, we're going to be looking at a climate more similar to Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia, Charlotte, you know, Atlanta. And, and Seattle is going to be more like Portland uh, in terms of weather. So most of the buildings we're talking about, maybe you can go ahead, Chunky, that's fine. You know, the, the buildings we're talk, talking about designing are going to be around for a while. Um, at Pete, I, I imagine they're not going to be building another uh, visitor center, hopefully ever on, on Pikes Peak. I think uh, we've learned some lessons from the last one. So you know, the, the, uh, the, the theme here is to understand the, the local climate here um, you know, in, in ter terms of the historical context, but we need to you know, think about, think forward and think as to what the uh, climate will be for the life cycle of the project. Um, and, you know, among, among the uh, strategies that we want, that we should be considering, um, you know, considering equipment life cycles, um, you know, loads that we uh, determine today um, could, um, you know, be um, inadequate going forward. So maybe there's room for a need for additional systems capacity or the need to flat out replace systems at the end of their useful life, which may be 30 years and, and maybe the time to do that. But then there's so much else that goes into a, a mechanical design, duct size, all those other things to, uh, to, um, to consider. So another, uh, another recommendation is to design beyond present code well beyond present code and, and even to, the, to design to exceed high performance standards. And I, I think when we're talking about those, you know, AI 2030 commitment, uh, those energy targets, um, you know, the, uh, the zero, zero code type tar targets, um, you know, those are the really the, the targets, the standards we should be thinking about. And uh, as you saw on that map, design for the next warmest climate, um, 
we, we have some pretty good projections at this point uh, as to what uh, what things might look like uh, in, the, in the near future. So, and then, and then lastly on this uh, slide, you know, endeavor to develop a future climate file for energy modeling and how, and, and how, how might you do that? So you can go ahead to the next slide, Jonathan. So, um, you know, and I want to, I also want to just take a moment too and thank uh, Drew Crawley for his, uh, his uh, advice uh, on this, uh, on this section. I, I admit this is a, this was a topic that I, uh, I, I kind of dove deep into over the last uh, few weeks while we were presenting, we were researching this. As, as we talked about, um, how, how old is the weather, weather data set? You know, oftentimes, uh, you know, you might be dealing with a weather data set that's even 15 or 20 years old. And it's important to note that 15, the last 15 years have had, I think it's 11 of the hottest uh, years on record. Um, so that tr that's clear, you know, there's clearly a trend to, to see there. And I think even the traditional energy, um, or, or I should say climate da or weather data files are, show are starting to tick upwards, um, even you know, the, the sampling period may be 50 years. So you want to develop a weather data set that, that's better representing the, uh, the current, ex the, and this is, uh, this is, I think, an approach that, uh, that, that uh, you know, Drew Crawley and others are, are advancing, is that we really should be looking at weather data sets, developing weather data sets that better re represent the current extreme conditions as a model for the, the changing climate uh, going forward. And a couple of things to think about, um, you know, you know, what, what does that mean? It means, you know, for us, for example, uh, heating degree days are, are going to be decreasing and cooling degree, day, degree days are going to be increasing. Um, this table we're looking at here uh, is, this is from uh, New York City resiliency uh, guidelines. And by the 2050s, they're talking about another thousand uh, degree, you know, cooling degree days. Now these are projections, these are based on you know, either business or usual, there's, there's, you know, uh, there's less aggressive cases, there's extreme cases, but um, all this goes to underscore why, why we're here and what we're, what we're trying to uh, do with the 2030 commitment. So to, to just kind of briefly touch on the, the climate data files, the, the, the original kind of climate uh, data files that, uh, that were first developed were kind of a mean uh, and I mean that in a mathematical way, um, data file. They would throw out the highs and lows. You would get a really kind of vanilla, simple you know, year that, that didn't really account for any extremes whatsoever. Um, you know, people start, they definitely the, uh, those who were, you know, uh, developing these, these weather data sets, you know, determined that that wasn't a great way to, to, to really uh, cut out the extremes. So that they developed the, the next uh, series of data sets that were developed with a typical meteorological year. These are more of an average. So it would include the best case, worst case, but it would still be average over, over the period, which could be, you know, 20, you know, 50 years. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, they got the, the suggestion is now to look at these uh, these TMY, these extreme weather data files, extreme meteorological year data files, and um, you know, uh, and these actually try to statistically um, incorporate, you know, weight the, uh, the the extreme weather, and so um, and and we put a link to to a, a to the climate one building site there, which uh, is a, is a place to go for uh, for some, some more uh, information on, on where to find those TMYX files. And these can be plugged into energy models. So I think uh, it was a, that was at the end of the section, John. Yep. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, thank you, Josh, for um, unpacking the climate data perspective. Um, so we do want to, uh, Pete mentioned um, outdoor comfort and how they change the, um, the, the set points in their building to relate to outdoor temperature and what people are wearing. And I think that's a really great driver for energy efficiency because you would use the energy a little bit less if your, um, your set points are lower or higher. So 
we're going to talk a little bit about metrics that help you understand what outdoor temperature feels like and how we can start relating that to the metrics that we um, un we can use to understand indoor temperature. And if we can get indoor temperature to feel like outdoor temperature and outdoor temperature is comfortable, then what does that mean? Like that we can use much less energy. So there's a metric called the Universal Thermal Climate Index. Um, this is something what uh, forecasters use. So they combine wind speed, radiation. So that's a measure of what you might feel if the sun is shining on you in a simplified way, uh, humidity and air temperature and combine those to give an equivalent air temperature, which is the feels like temperature. So in the winter, we get that a lot like with wind speeds, although the temperature is 17 degrees, it feels like below zero. So um, using that kind of metric, um, helps us understand how how comfortable outdoors might be. So here is um, an example UTCI calculation um, for the city of Melbourne in Australia. Um, I pulled this uh, from some of my academic work, but uh, so it's not in our um, hemisphere. It's in the southern hemisphere. So summer actually is more like winter. Um, it might be a little bit flipped than what you're used to, um, but the, the idea behind this is we can identify how much how much time during the year people can be comfortable without heating or cooling and what percentage of the year people are actually really hot or really cold and you can bracket that information down to um, uh, seasons and understand it um, at different scales. So if you look at a chart like this, you know when you need to turn your cooling on in the summer and when you need to provide heating in the winter, right? Like this is a really great starting point to kind of, uh, in addition to understanding what people are wearing or what activities they're doing, um, which this is a good starting point for that. So, um, and then there, that's the outdoor metrics, UTCI. Then we have an outdoor metric, I mean, sorry, indoor metric called adaptive comfort model. So if anyone's familiar with ASHRAE 55 and you're, you've worked on a natural ventilation building, you might be familiar with this metric. So the most important thing to understand about the adaptive comfort model is that it is strongly dependent on outdoor temperature. So it's so important for us to understand what outdoor conditions are before we can design a system within our building. And um, that being said, on their own, these metrics are not spatially explicit, right? The adaptive comfort chart is looking at one point uh, and a, a set of conditions. The UTCI is also looking at a single location across um, a year, but it's, it's a single point, a single condition. To make them spatially explicit, we have to be able to map them. So this is a, um, a diagram that shows UTCI spatially mapped. You can think of it like a CFD study almost, but looking at it only for the, the metrics of air, radiant, air temperature, radiant temperature, heat, uh, sorry, humidity and wind speed, um, and mapping both UTCI on the exterior and then your adaptive comfort on the inside. And this is when, this is where you can start understanding how to make changes to your facade that allow for this gradient to be what you want it to be, whether you want to bring cool air from outside in because it's heated up too much, or if you want to bring the opposite in, like uh, the opposite of uh, heating or allow the sun to come and give you passive heating. Um, all right, so these two are examples of like, tools or uh, metrics that we can start using. Um, so where can we start as architects um, and designers? So here is our table of all the tools that are out there. We have tools that allow us to understand climate and energy and thermal comfort together. Some tools will allow you to do all three, some will not. So you're um, moving between different tools. Uh, I'm not going to go through each of these, but I do want to highlight the free tools that are on here. Um, climate Consultant, 
Clima Plus and WeatherSpark are all free tools for understanding what your weather conditions are. Um, and uh, if you are paying for Cove tools, it does allow you to integrate that with energy modeling and with um, 3D spatially explicit uh, studies. Um, and then Ladybug Tools is the only tool that actually allows for the spatial mapping of thermal comfort uh, metrics that um, I know of. But if there are other tools, I would welcome anyone to add um, them in the chat box so we can share it with the rest of the group because there are a lot of tools out there and this is a great um, avenue to share them with folks.